Sorry about that. Hi, this is Alan Gassman. It is now 11.01 a.m., Tuesday, November 1st. I'm here with a very esteemed group of speakers. We have my partner, Ken Crotty, and then my friends, Allison Freeman and James Constable. And we're gonna talk about some pretty serious stuff today. Normally I'm joking around and I have the puppets and all that stuff, but there's been a lot of significant loss of life and also a lot of property damage, a lot of disruption of businesses, a lot of disruption of, of families. So what we're gonna talk about here is important. It is being uh, recorded and we hope that you will uh, pay good attention and share the recording, which we will send you later with anyone who you think has the need for uh, what we're gonna talk about. Uh, do post your questions and uh, welcome to the presentation. If uh, you have any questions that you wanna ask, you can go to the questions panel, you can click on the inverted pyramid, type in your question, and if we know the answer, we'll answer it, and if we don't know the answer, we'll pretend that we did not see it. Sure. You can join uh, James and Wesley Dixon of our firm in Fort Myers, live and free, on November 7th, that's Monday, and from 6.30 to 7.30, you'll hear more about the hurricane, bring your families and friends, and uh, then from 7.45 to 8.35, we'll be giving everyone a copy of our book on eight steps to a proper Florida estate plan, and my partner, Christopher DiNicola, will be speaking. If you want a deeper dive on the tax planning, then you can go to YouTube and watch our webinar, 139 Disaster Relief Tax Opportunities, especially if you're interested in the charitable area of tax law, you definitely want to hear Carl Mills. That is not for credit, but if you need the information, you can have the information. Now, I want to thank Hurricane Ian for only hitting a few areas of Florida hard, and we need to add to this Daytona Beach, which also got hit pretty hard. So, you know, if this hurricane had come through the Tampa Bay area, it would have been, I would think, 10 to 20 times as bad economically and personally. So one thing I want to say to you is it's easy to say, oh, I'm just going to stay in my home and shelter down and I'll be safe because I don't want to leave the dog. Well, the dog probably wants you to get in the car and drive the dog somewhere else, like the other side of the state where a hurricane can slow down before it gets to you, because we did have loss of lives. And you're gonna see pictures here where there was a house, now there's nothing but the foundation. So think about safety for you and your clients. I also am giving you here the FEMA information. FEMA will be writing a lot of checks to a lot of people in need. So if people are calling you and they need money, you can have them call the SBA, have them call FEMA to see what they can benefit for. The rules here by FEMA are pretty darn nebulous. So a lot of it has to do with whoever evaluates the application. But up to 37,900 for housing allowance, up to 37,900 for other assistance. In many situations, you have to apply for an SBA loan and be rejected in order to for FEMA to uh, consider you. But they also will help businesses, small businesses who got obliterated and need financial assistance, that can come from FEMA. And SBA loans can be extremely helpful and extremely lenient. So this is certainly not a FEMA presentation, nor am I a FEMA expert, but we've given you what we've been able to find here on slides, and certainly it can be worthwhile if you have family or friends in this situation. Another thing I wanted to mention, uh, that applies if you're in the charitable realm is an extremely benevolent uh, set of rules published by the IRS for disaster victim relief, where, for example, if your client is a retired business person and wants to benefit his ex-employees who made him what he was and would like to get a tax deduction, there's not going to be an income tax 
business deduction, but he could give money to a new private foundation or to an existing uh, community foundation, get the tax deduction, and then an impartial committee can go ahead and award monies to people who work for her or him or even family members as long as you have a, a proper committee set up. And you can also expedite your approval of a 501c3 organization and the award that is given to can be friends and loved ones will be tax free to them under section 139. So I've got the uh, materials here. Carl Mills did a wonderful job explaining this in the webinar that you have access to. So uh, just keep it in mind and enjoy these materials. I'm gonna do the first polling question here. And Allison and James, just so you know, in some states, they don't trust that CPAs are actually listening to the presentation. So they have to answer three out of four polling questions. And the first polling question is, what states are in the Ian federally declared disaster area? And the answer is Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina, and therefore all of the above. So if you just click on any letter there, we will uh, go to the next slide once we have 90% presentation, I mean participation, which I see we have. So, uh, let's go now to page 57 and turn this over to Allison and James. I think we're going to do this as a conversational presentation. So, first of all, Allison and James, what is it like when you are acting as a fiduciary, you're acting it, you help storm victims for a living. How, do, how does all this feel when you go to Sanibel Island and see that there's not a single building that can be used, that people have lost everything there? Even if they have insurance, they have to start over. You know, how, how does that feel? What kind of experience is that professionally? Uh, well, I'll say I, I was out at Sanibel Island uh, a few weeks ago as one of the first uh, boats to go out there before the bridge was reopened. And it's almost almost overwhelming. You look at the amount of damage and how widespread it is. Um, you know, these houses and condominiums, that the picture on the slide is actually a condominium I was inspecting with a FEMA adjuster and a wind adjuster. And uh, just every single unit in that building uh, was, was totally uninhabitable. And you see personal property scattered all over the place. And you realize that this isn't just a storm that creates property damage, but one that totally disrupts lives. And so I know Allison and I both feel uh, privileged to work on uh, the capacity that we do to help, you know, kind of through that rebuilding process, um, you know, and, and, and getting, you know, back to some sort of modicum of, of normalcy. But I will tell you for a lot of people down there, especially in Sanibel and Captiva and Fort Myers Beach, uh, it's going to be months, if not years, uh, before things are, are you know, rebuilt uh, to the way they were before the storm. Well, and I think um, I, I, well, I see a mental health counselor. I recommend everyone do it. But um, she and I were speaking that I've been having um, trouble sleeping lately. And I feel like for those of us, especially that lived in the Tampa area, when we were, I guess, quote unquote, missed with this storm, um, we kind of felt that sense of relief but then also kind of that guilt that it, we were watching on tv it happened somewhere else and so i think a lot of people have been able to remove themselves from that as time has gone on but doing what we do we see it every day and i talk to people every day that are still um experiencing it don't have their homes you know their kids schools were shut down that kind of thing so i think i'm reliving it every day which makes it just way really heavy on me especially when i look at my own kids and i'm thankful that we are not experiencing the same disaster that they did um, so like James said, it's just, I'm thankful that I can offer these people some sort of assistance and help, but it's just, you know, there's just that feeling of some guilt having been in Tampa and knowing that it was possibly going to hit here and then having it take that turn. These hurricanes just, there's that, uh, sense of like 
oh my gosh, it's not us, but then, oh no, it's other people. So being able to help those other people definitely is a benefit, but um, hearing them and talking to them and knowing there's a lot of people who have gone up north to stay with family and aren't sure when they're going to come back down or how often they're going to be able to come back down or whether they'll be able to get all of their items out of buildings that have been red flagged has become a very scary situation um, for them in a very sad situation. So, and I found this picture that James had sent when he was on Sanibel so interesting because of the flag, especially how it's torn like that. Um, but it's still, it, I mean, it just, it just shows you that, you know, you've got a building standing, but it's not, there's just holes in everything there, right? There's open gaping building that it's still standing, but it's just not a building anymore. So um, I thought this was really representative of what he had explained to us in the videos that he'd shown of what he'd seen in Sanibel um, and what we'd heard about. So James, this, it looks like this building had parking on the first floor and then everything above it was, was going to be protected. How, how far above the sea level was this, was this building? So that picture is taken standing on the beach. So immediately behind me is, is the Gulf. And you're right, the downstairs uh, portion of this building uh, is parking and uh, storage for the unit owners. And then of course you've got residential um, dwellings in, in, in the second, third and fourth floor. The flood line in that particular building actually uh, consumed all the parking area, all of the first floor and was several feet into the third floor. Oh. So you've got, yeah, totally inundated the uh, the top floor are the only residences in this particular building that didn't have flood damage, but of course they're immediately below the roof. The roof of this building, although it looks like it's fairly intact from, from down on the ground, it was ripped apart um, up on the top and there's active leaks all throughout uh, this building. Did anyone try to, did anyone stay in this building through the hurricane? Yeah, actually, the gentleman I was out there with, who's the president of the association, uh, stayed uh, in, in the building with his wife and another couple, and they said it was some of the most exhausting and terrifying hours they've ever spent uh, in, in, in their life. Uh, but they did. They waited out the storm, and, uh, and then the Coast Guard came a couple days later. But uh, by and large, and this is right in the middle of Sanibel Island, um, by and large, uh, the, the, the vast majority um, of, of the units and and of the entire island was evacuated. So, so why would a why would a condominium association or the owner of a building like this need a lawyer? Won't the insurance company just come over and write them a check and buy them a new building? Well, in theory, that would be great. Uh, but I will tell you that in Florida, we have probably the most contentious property insurance market in the country. Uh, we've got uh, you know news articles that were circulating well in advance of the storm about insurance companies that were you know, struggling financially. And, uh, you know, we've heard about it in the last several legislative sessions about abuse by assignment of benefits contractors and, and um, you know, excessive litigation. So, uh, you know, the pendulum swings back and forth, but we, we live in a very contentious state. Um, and, you know, some insurance companies are better than others, uh, for sure. I'm not definitely not here to just knock insurance companies across the board because there are insurance adjusters that try to do the right thing and do write checks and restore the buildings uh, as they should be. But um, in our experience, a lot of the insurance companies in the state of Florida uh, come, come at these from a defensive position. You know, the adjusters that come out in the field are usually pretty amicable, uh, but when it comes time to receive checks is when, uh, you know, there's a, a real obvious shortage, especially right now. I mean, in this time of inflation and increasing construction costs, now more than ever, uh, are there going to be disputes between what an insurance company adjuster writes as the estimate of repairs and what the real world cost of repairs is? And um, un unfortunately, you know, you, you can't just rely on what the insurance adjuster tells you to determine whether there's coverage or not. You know, Allison and I spend most of our days reviewing coverage decisions that were sent by an insurance company. And when we look at the damage and we look at the estimate of repairs, we look at the insurance policies, there's always more. There's always additional money that the policyholder was entitled to that the insurance company didn't pay. So that's what leads to us getting involved in a lot of these claims as kind of a quasi public adjuster and attorney uh, at the same time where we work for policyholders and try to make sure they're getting paid everything they're entitled to. Okay, can you talk about what a public adjuster is versus what a lawyer is? And, and a lot of our attendees are outside of Florida. So to the extent that you need to say in Florida, this generalize 
otherwise. Sure. So, you know, insurance companies have adjusters that work for them, right? You call your insurance company, they say, we'll send an adjuster out in the next few days to inspect your damage and, uh, and um, you know, prepare an estimate for repairs. Um, the alternative to an, a, an adjuster that's being paid and hired directly by the insurance company is often called a public adjuster or a private adjuster. And I think a lot of what Allison and I do would be considered that um, you can become a public adjuster or you know transition your license from being an insurance company adjuster to one who helps policyholders, um, or you can be an attorney. Um, either either having a public adjusting license through the state regulatory agency, and just about every state in the country has licensure for adjusters. Um, and what what we do is, as attorneys, we advocate for homeowners as well. Uh, we just have the ability to uh, carry the stick of filing a lawsuit if we need to if the negotiations aren't working out the way we want them to. Okay. Can you tell us what is a typical timetable? Because I know day one, you hopefully have documented that your house is in great condition. Day two, there's, and day one, you also have insurance. So then day two, a hurricane blows through. And then day three, it seems to me the first thing to do is to have a very thorough inspection right after the hurricane so that the company can't claim that this happened a few weeks after the hurricane, I guess. And then you put your claim in with the insurance agency. Am I following the right order or what, what is the order? Yeah, no, you're right. Um, and what's remarkable is in Florida, uh, the legislator uh, gives insurance companies 90 days to make a coverage determination, uh, which is an exceptional amount of time. Um, you know, if you think about the folks that are living in some of these units waiting on a check to you know, so that they can have money for additional living expenses and contents and start the process of reconstruction and rebuilding. Uh, but, uh, you know, a typical time frame is, as you discussed, insurance company comes out. We're at the 30 day mark. Last Friday was 30 days since uh, Hurricane Ian hit. Um, and we're starting to see coverage letters come in. We're starting to see some checks come in. Uh, I think it's pretty typical for the insurance company to take a month or maybe up to 45 days, uh, which is really over the next couple of weeks. Uh, to get a check out. Um, and then from there, you know, oftentimes that's when we'll get involved. When the check shows up in the mailbox and the homeowner or the building owner says, this this just is not enough money to fix everything, then we'll get involved. We'll send out an estimating team to go um, look at the property from our perspective, um, you know, review the insurance policy, make sure all the uh, coverages that are available are being paid. And then from there, then we're reopening the claim, right? So we're sending our estimate and claims package to the insurance company. Um, and, and, you know, trying to put them on the clock. Okay. All right. Very good. Uh, why is there so much controversy? How, how come an, a homeowner inspector or a roof inspector from an insurance company can have such a different view of roof damage than an independent inspector? Well, I think, um, I think with the hurricane, you're going to have a lot of, you know, properties in ground zero and there's no dispute you know that rip was, roof was ripped apart it needs to be replaced and the insurance company's on the hook for replacing it it's just a matter of what the cost of repairs is going to be at that point uh, but there's a lot of properties that are in the outskirts and maybe they're missing 20 shingles or 30 shingles or they're missing a section of tiles from the ground it doesn't look like there's a lot of damage at all but then they start experiencing leaks when the rainstorms come in the following you know days weeks or months um, and if, if a roof didn't leak before the storm and now it does leak after the storm, that's something that needs to be addressed. Even if from the street, it looks like minor damage. If the hurricane reduced the lifespan of that roof such that it's not keeping the water out, there's a darn good argument that the roof should be replaced, you know, as part of the insurance claim. Um, and, you know, look, there's a lot of subjective analysis that goes into this. The person that's looking at it, uh, whether they're being paid to represent the insurance company or paid to represent the policyholder, unfortunately, uh, has a lot of impact on, on coverage opinions. Well, and there's a benefit to finding a certain number of damaged shingles for the insurance company versus the homeowner because you start to look at replacement versus repairs. So for an insurance company, if they can find, you know, the I think people have probably seen the FEMA is 50%. For, uh, for us, for our purposes, we look at 25%. So if there's a 25% 
um, damaged shingles, then we're looking at our tiles, then we're saying we want replacement. Where if an insurance company says, oh, there's only 11%, you can do a repair with matching tiles or matching shingles, that saves them a lot of money, right? Because a replacement is much more, it's much more significant than just repairs. So of course, there's always just, it all comes down to money, right? Who's trying to, they're trying to save and um, any way they can do that. And also with the interior damages, most of these policies, pretty much all these policies are going to say that you have to have apparel that impacts the property that causes the water to enter. So when they find that there's no wind created opening or no, the hurricane didn't create an opening, then they get to say, okay, we're not covering any of your interior damages, which knocks out a lot of damage on a, um, on a claim. And like James was saying, when somebody's, you know, you've got a half a roof ripped off. Okay. That's a little bit easier, but, um, and I think, there's other instances where there's it's not as easy to see this impact on the roof that allowed water to enter and i um did have a case where they lifted the roof and dropped it right back in place and no one could tell and it had allowed water to enter during that time and we had to have an expert come out and say that was exactly what had occurred on that property because no one could tell until they started looking at the trusses so um there's definitely you know it's all money, but it's about where you're trying to save dollars and cents and where you're trying to find it to be able to get the repairs done that you need to put your house in its pre-loss condition. Okay. W what kind of professional can I trust to go up there and tell me what's going on? Does it need to be a licensed roofer? Does it need to be a structural engineer? What, what initials after their names am I looking for? <laughs> um, I would say either, I mean, Roofers are going to be able to also take a look at it, um, dependent on how much of a dispute you're in. We always, we like to have roofers take a look, but we like to get um, engineers involved if it's going to be dispute whether or not the roof is covered and whether or not, like I said, whether a wind created opening occurred, um, because that's, you want that licensure, you want that individual who's um, got that expertise to be able to tell you. So, I mean, my argument would be, I guess it depends on what you're looking at for the damages and what the dispute is, um, because if they're not disputing that a wind crate open was made, do you need an engineer or not? Um, but you're definitely going to get assistance more from an engineer who has the background, has the licensure. Um, not that a roofer can't say, hey, you need a roof replaced, but your engineer is going to be able to um, provide more testimony on that if they needed to in litigation. So is that... Our, our typical case, we're sending out either a general contractor or a licensed adjuster. And if there's any question as to what's causing the damage, then we follow that up by sending out a uh, an engineer. And in Florida, they, they have the initials PE after their name. Yes, that's right. And there's only a, there's less than a thousand of those in the state. I think I heard once upon a time. Not very yeah, many. <laughs> but you can check the licensure of the adjusters as well um, and the general contractors. All of them are available. You know, if you search through Florida licensure, you can check to make sure that even your general contractors have licenses. Okay. Uh, before I forget, when when a CPA or a lawyer, when I'm doing estate planning or a CPA is doing financial planning, what what types of coverages do we need to look for to sell, say to the client, hey, you have a windstorm, but you don't have flood? Uh, have you thought about flood? What Can you tell us what you would think that that conversation would sound like if I actually knew what I was doing and I was trying to help a client be sensible? Right. Um, I usually tell people to get both, <laughs> just uh, whether you're in a flood zone or not, just because if there's the possibility of standing water that's going to seep in um, around the foundation of your home, that would be what they would consider flood type damage and try to say that it's not caused by wind and um, I guess eliminate it. And so like, for example, my home is in zone D, I believe, but there is water near me that they have had you know, overflow and things like that, where people have had water seep into their homes when the water gets high enough. Um, so for most people, if you can, I tell them to get both to be safe. But at the very least, if you're not in a flood zone, you're of course going to want your windstorm slash hurricane because that's going to cover even your crazy afternoon storm in the middle of summer where, you know, it's not technically a hurricane, but you've got some crazy damage that occurs. So at the very least, you need to have windstorm um, slash hurricane coverage and then for most I do recommend flood. Okay. Now when a client is building a home, what would I say? Are you getting date rated uh glass or what 
you know, what what is the terminology you would use when somebody's building a home or somebody's thinking about buying a home that would hopefully do better in the storm than than a house of straw? A Florida building code certainly helps with that. You know, there's uh, really following Hurricane Andrew in 92, there's been amendments to the Florida building code and there's been some substantial revisions made over the years that uh, are continually aimed at improving construction methodology. Uh, a lot of properties with impact glass metal roofs seem to do very, very well. Um, you know, newer construction following the Florida building code holds up a lot better than these older homes that we see, especially in these low-lying areas. And that's really where the 50% rule kicks in with flood, because if you've got a house that was built in the 70s or 80s, you know, the, no, it doesn't have impact glass, um, not hurricane strap roof. Those are the houses that, that really uh, do the worst in these types of storms. Okay. Um, before we go to polling question on page 51, how how do PAs get get paid and how do lawyers get paid in these situations? So public adjusters uh, are typically taking a percentage of the claim. Um, if it's not a hurricane, typically a public adjuster is taking 20%. If it is a hurricane, a public adjuster is taking 10%. Um, with attorneys, uh, works a little bit different because there's uh, one-way prevailing party attorney's fees, okay? So as long as the insurance company's conduct leads the policyholder to hire an attorney, um, and then the attorney's conduct results in a payment on the claim, then the insurance company owes attorney's fees and costs, right? So as soon as the insurance company sends a letter to my client that says, here's how much we're paying, here's your check, this is what our coverage determination is, at that point, if somebody hires Allison and I, we put our claims package together, submit it to the insurance company, we get an additional payment on the claim, now the insurance company is on the hook for paying our fees and costs on top of that amount. And that's really where, you know, there's advantages in hiring attorneys over a public adjuster because rather than giving up a percentage of the claim, we're able to seek recovery and then get our attorney's fees paid on top of the amount of the claim. Wow. Does the attorney-client privilege work the same way with a lawyer as it does with a PA? It, it it does not. So with public adjuster, there is no attorney client privilege. And we see it often when a claim gets to litigation. You know, well, what did your public adjuster tell you? What what discussions did you have with the public adjuster regarding coverages or regarding, you know, the contents list that you submitted to us, et cetera? Um, with um, you know, the involvement of a law firm, of course, uh, we're able to maintain attorney client privilege. Uh, we can hold things close to the vest within the rules, of course, um, you know, to maintain confidentiality or some of those conversations. Okay, so Brittany, let's go ahead and roll out this polling question. Can litigants recover attorney's fees for storm damage litigation in Florida? The answer is A, yes. The answer is not B, no. But if you answer B, you still get a passing grade. <laughs> Just like kindergarten. <laughs> Okay, and we got the vast majority of people answered A, I'm sure. Okay, have some questions from the audience here that I think are pretty timely. Um, what about sinkhole in, insurance in Florida? Can you get it, and and how does that work? You can. It's very it's not as prevalent as it once was. It's very difficult to get and very expensive. Um, they've made a lot of changes over the years to what is considered sinkhole loss. So um, I'm seeing it less and less and less. And I know that when people ask for it, a lot of uh, carriers don't provide it or they require you to have an engineer come out, inspect your property, more so on the residential side than on the commercial, but on the residences, they will have you have an engineer come out, inspect your property, say that they do not see anything that may be construed as sinkhole, cover, like sinkhole damage, and then you can get a policy. Um, that's a very expensive thing to take on. An engineer is not cheap to take a look at your home for potential sinkhole type damage. Um, also, I guess there's always the concern, what if they said yes? Because then you <laughs> don't have coverage and you also have an engineer telling you you might. So for residences, it is very, very difficult. We very rarely see it these days. Um, on the commercial side, it's much more common to have sinkhole coverage. Okay. All right, great. Uh, now, Deborah asked, she said, I am in uh, Northport, 
and I'm in a park that has been hard hit, how would you how would you address a, a whole neighborhood? Can you can you help a neighborhood or neighborhoods pulling together and sharing lawyers and PAs or or what happened? Um, you know that that's the way our business uh, tends to tends to grow is through networking. Uh, Allison, I don't uh, really do any advertising. A lot of it's word of mouth. So we do end up working in neighborhoods or condominium communities, uh, et cetera. But uh, I, we right now have 13 adjusters that are in Port Charlotte and Ponta Gorda and Fort Myers, um, and that, that's exactly what they're doing is um, you know grouping the properties that we represent. Uh, and on a particular day or week, they're going into that neighborhood, writing estimates and photos, et cetera. Um, I think we have, in the last 30 days, taken on somewhere around 300 claims. And with all of them, we've been able to do inspections within about 72 hours and get our claims packages together. So uh, we're able to work pretty efficiently, but we've also been doing this for 15 years. I'd like to think we have a pretty well-oiled machine at this point. Yeah. But yeah. Technically, you do have to represent every single individual, though, because all of you are going to have different policies, different properties. Um, sadly, I wish I could say that insurance companies say, oh, look, this whole neighborhood got hit. But you'd be surprised how many times we have coverage on one house, no coverage on the house next door. So um, you do, even if we assist a whole neighborhood, we do have to represent each individual just because of the different policies and the different um, damages at each property itself. Okay. By the way, some people are having trouble with the polling questions. If you just put in your question box, couldn't answer that one or something, we'll make sure everybody gets credit. And I apologize if there's any issues on that. Okay, here's a question. Should I have a four-point inspection of my house once a year just to be safe? Well, what the four-point inspection does is helps with uh, insurance rates. I mean, the, the four-point inspection uh, goes and looks at the various components of the house and makes sure that they're up to current code. Um, I'm not sure that getting one yearly really changes anything, but getting a four-point inspection at one point or another will help because your insurance rates will go down. Um, now, you, you could have an inspection done on your property every year. It doesn't necessarily have to be a four-point inspection, uh, but, you know, there's always benefits to going and inspecting, you know, those components. The four-point inspection looks at the roofing, uh, the electrical, plumbing, and HVAC. And those are regular maintenance items that, that somebody should be looking at. It doesn't have to be a four-point inspector, but absolutely, these are systems within a house that should be looked at on a regular basis. Would you, so if I'm the trustee of a trust that owns a house, should I, would you say I should do that once a year, every two years, or is there a rule of thumb? I think uh, once a year is probably a good rule of thumb. You know, maybe it's at the time of an insurance renewal for memory's sake. Uh, one of the things that, um, that Allison and I see on on, on claims is, uh, you know, you talk about like uh, Deborah, for example, being in Northport, uh, you know, Port Charlotte got hit real hard, but you go on the outskirts of, of, of Northport and the winds were not as strong, but did damage the roofs. And so we're gonna see a lot of letters from the insurance company that talk about pre-existing damages or maintenance items. And so, you know, the insurance company looks at it and says, hey, this is a, a 13 year old roof. And yeah, we see some damage up there, but we're not attributing that to the hurricane, we're attributing that to pre-existing damage or maintenance issues, therefore the claims being denied or maybe only a portion of the damage is being covered. If we've got photos from prior to the storm that show the condition of the roof, that can be extremely helpful to disproving that, right? And so we've got property managers that we work with and we'll send someone out on a yearly basis to do basically an inspection of the roof um, you know, in the interior ceiling so that we can document the condition of the building. You know, it takes an hour or two, let somebody go out there, build that file so that if a storm or a loss occurs, we can disprove uh, or establish that this damage was from, from the occurrence of the storm, uh, you know, whether it's a hurricane or a hailstorm or, you know, whatever the situation is. And beyond those four point, it's not just a four point, but what James is mentioning about the maintenance, that's why it's important to maintain your receipts. If you have someone who comes out yearly and paints your home or comes out, um, you know, let's say you're getting ready for the holidays and you want them to come out and do a bunch of, um, you know, certain things around your home to get it ready for those holidays, which seems to be when people do all this stuff, um, keep track of all that because that is proof that you've maintained your home, you've kept it in good condition. So that way when they're pointing to certain damages and saying, this is wear and tear, this was existing damage, this was already there, you've got proof that you've maintained your home year after year. So whether that ends up being 
some sort of an inspection report or just keeping those receipts that just all becomes um, support for you for why your claim should get paid and why you've taken care of your property. Okay, that's that's really good. And especially when you have elderly clients, they should have a four point inspection and they should call you before they ever spend money on someone who shows up at their door and says that they need uh, help. I wanna also just mention that I'm hearing about a lot of unlicensed roofers who are showing up at people's houses and taking thousands of dollars and messing up a roof that maybe even didn't have a problem. So if you're gonna hire a roofer, make darn sure that they're reputable, make sure that they're licensed, ask for a copy of their insurance declaration uh, page. So one of the questions here is whether James and Allison can recommend a particular public adjuster, a particular inspector, a particular lawyer. Well, they're gonna recommend themselves as the lawyer, I'll tell you that. But also, I know that they don't keep a list. James recommends me, and that's how it all. Yeah, right. I know they don't keep a list, but if you have a particular issue, just email me or them. I'm a gasman at gasmanpay.com, and we can answer questions, you know, a little bit more intimately and specifically. And I see a couple of you have uh, homeowner associations. You're looking for speakers. Well, Allison and James are all over the state, so you know the next time they go to your town, they they'll be glad to come, and and. Uh, talk about this. I, I heard from an, the adjuster who came to look at our roof for the insurance company. I got really friendly with him because his sister and I have a common friend. And he said, oh, by the way, 98% uh, of the people who hire a lawyer and try to get more money from my company succeed. 98% was his guess. Could it be that high that insurance companies are just calling you know, this this is just a first offer. Is there a rule of thumb in the industry, or why is it that they're so commonly offering so little money? Yeah, it it really is it really is common. And we saw it after Hurricane Irma too. The state of Florida had more than a million claims after Hurricane Irma. But here's the terrible statistic: less than 150,000 of those claims were ever reopened. So all of the claims go out. You know, they get a disposition letter, whether it's below deductible or a payment from the insurance company. And less, less than 20% of the homeowners or policyholders that receive those checks or letters ever called the insurance company and said, hey, this check might be a little light. Maybe I'm entitled to more money. 85% of them went away without ever even contacting the insurance company again. That statistic right there tells you everything you need to know. The vast majority of people get the check in the mail, they get the letter from the insurance company, and they never do anything at all. And so our, our you know, big message is, just because you got a check in the mail, just because you got a letter from the insurance company, that is not the end of the road. That's where we get started. That's where we want to get started. We want to get involved. After you've gotten every nickel from your insurance company, you can get on your own. Don't sign a settlement agreement that releases the claim. You can still deposit whatever check that they send you, okay, as long as you're not signing a final settlement um, or a release. Those are the, the, the words to watch out for, a final settlement or a release. But typically, you get a letter from the insurance company, you get a check, and the file's closed, and it just dies on the vine. And those are the exact claims that Allison and I are looking for because we know that it's really close. It's, it's 100%. I mean, the only, the only example I can think of where we could look at it and be able to get more money for the policyholder uh, is where there's just simply no coverage. I talked to three lawyers this past week. All three of them had properties that were affected by the storm, and their policy specifically excluded windstorm. They just didn't have hurricane coverage under their policies. And even as lawyers, they were unsure of that. You know, there's nothing we can do to help them. But if there's coverage under the policy, they've got a windstorm coverage, I guarantee there's something that's missed in the insurance company's estimate. There's some coverage that the homeowner is entitled to, the adjuster just didn't afford. Right, right. Okay, beautiful. All right, so James and Allison, we're gonna let Ken have the last 20 minutes which for most attendees is called half an hour on their time slips. And Ken, I'm gonna start with a polling question. And you can leave the discussion of this polling question if you like. Sure, um, can a victim amend their 2021 income tax return and take a casually lost deduction for loss of value? And the answer for that is yes, uh, you have the ability um, in this situation because of the federally declared disaster area to take your casualty loss and actually amend the return rather than that for 2021 uh, rather than having to wait to take it on the 2022 return. That is, and it's, it's a, is an, it, 
it's against the ordinary income? Um, yeah, I believe so. It would just be applicable to uh, what was allowable. You know, there's no difference between what would be allowable for 2022 versus 2021. Um, and as far as the, we, I think, are still waiting on some confirmation from Congress uh, with respect to whether certain items will be waived about if it's going to be a 10% limitation or itemized. Um, you know, in the past, frequently they've waived certain uh, requirements like that if you are in a uh, federally declared disaster area. So it's likely that that'll happen again. Okay. So the polling question answer is yes. Even though the storm took place in 2022, if your client lives in the disaster area, they can amend their 2021 return and get a check. And this includes what, as Ken's going to discuss, it's not only what it costs to fix your house, but it's also how much value your house lost as the result of the permanent damage to the home. So, uh, Brittany, did we launch this polling question? Has it been answered? Yes, you're good to go. Okay. Fantastic. So Ken, I'm gonna bring you here to uh, the casualty loss section. And is this where you wanna start? Sure, yep, that would be fine, thanks. Um, okay, so with casualty losses, one of the main things to consider is you need to figure out if you are in a trader business or if we're just talking about your personal property. Um, the basic ideas behind the two elements are pretty much the same. Uh, as a general rule, if I have property that's been um, damaged, not destroyed. I need to take the fair market value of the property before the casualty event and then whatever the fair market value of the property is immediately after the casualty event. Um, if I am going to be in a trade or business situation, it's limited to the amount of my basis. Uh, the same is true for uh, if I'm dealing with private property as well. Now, when we're talking about the fair market value, uh, you need to take that snapshot immediately before and immediately after. Um, typically, it would be a situation where you would need to have uh, two different appraisals. Um, it, again, frequently in disaster situations, especially when we're dealing with personal property, uh, the IRS and the Congress will limit or you know, reduce that restriction um, and allow you to kind of just have one appraisal that deals with both elements. Uh, one item to note is that if we're talking about someone's house and the fair market value of the house, when it's determined, that that value, what you get the actual deduction for, um, is what was caused by the hurricane. Uh, so it would be directly result of the flood or the wind damage. Um, if the value of the home has gone down yeah, in addition because of the fact that buyers maybe would be hesitant to go into that area, um, that reduction is not a casually lost deduction. It's only the tangible uh, deduction that, you, or the deduction is limited to the tangible damage that let's say that you could see. It does not take into account the value of any uh, reduced value for the property because of the fact that the buyers may not want to go to that area anymore as a result of the hurricane. Um, another item that's applicable both to uh, trade or business and personal property is that if you are compensated for insurance, that's going to reduce the loss deduction that you have applicable, So, uh, which is logical sense. And then, Alan, if we can go forward. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. So um, one simple chart kind of laying it out. Again, if I'm dealing with uh, trade or business, if I have damaged property, it's the lesser of the reduction in value or my adjusted basis. Um, one thing to note when this is unique to trade or business property is that if I have property that's fully destroyed, and let's say the value was $100, if it's trade or business property, I can get a $100 deduction because it's been fully destroyed. But if I'm dealing again with trade or business property, if I have a basis in that property in excess of $100, let's say my basis in the property is $125, if it's trade or business property, my deduction is equal to the full $125, not just the $100 difference uh, related to the fair market value reduction. That's something that's unique for trade or business. If we were dealing with personal property, even if my basis was higher, it's the lesser of the fair market value or the adjusted basis. So again, if I was dealing with personal property and it was worth $100, if my basis was worth $125 and it was destroyed, I would only get the $100 deduction. Um, but if I was dealing with property that's in my trader business, 
in that situation because the basis is 125, I get the 125 for the deduction. All right, and then Alan, if we can go forward again, please. So again, this is another chart kind of just laying out what we just talked about. Um, the black box at the top is the general rule that's applicable to both. Uh, you'll see a couple of items that we uh, have that are unique for the trader business. Uh, one of the items deals with the limitation on basis on the left, like we talked about. One other item that's different between the two different categories uh, that I have not touched on yet is that if you're dealing with trader business property, each separate item needs to be computed separately. Um, so if I'm dealing with, let's say my, I have a resident, uh, it's a, I'm using it either as a rental property, um, let's say. If I have that residence, I need to look at the disruption caused by the, you know, to the actual residence um, and calculate that. But then in addition, if I have trees and, and other items, you know, plants and shrubbery that I put on there, uh, that's a, a, an improvement that needs to be calculated separately apart from the actual damage to the building. Um, and that would be a separate appraisal, or at least would have a separate component in the appraisal. Um, and again, you'd have to go through the actual looking at what the fair market value was of your trees before the storm, what the fair market value is after. Um, that's an actual deduction just related to the trees. It's in addition to what you would otherwise have for the building. Now, if it's personal use property, uh, the trees are included as part of the building. Um, and so in that distinction there, uh, you know, I'm looking at the total loss as one, one math problem as opposed to two separate problems. All right, the other items that you see for additional rules on the personal use property um, are restrictions, which again are applicable to taking casualty loss deductions for personal use property generally. Uh, but in the past, these restrictions, um, the 10% limitation, the $100 limit limitation, uh, the deductions, et cetera, um, these have been waived by Congress. Um, you know, in, in the past, for example, uh, even though the deduction is a uh, itemized deduction, in the past, Congress has waived that so you could take the standard deduction and also claim this as well. I'm just trying to make it more available to more taxpayers. So, and Alan, if we can go forward again, please. All right, um, and this, actually we can skip this slide because this is all contained on the chart that we just had. Uh, and so what we've got here is we've got an example here, um, and then I don't know that we're going to have time to actually go through it, but we have two examples from the uh, regulations that are attached as well. Um, and the examples from the regulations go through how to calculate the uh, casualty loss. They go through the, show you the distinction between the private property and um, trade or business property. Uh, but doing a simple example here, this is the way that you would actually calculate the deduction. Uh, so if we were looking at a cost basis for my chair, for example, of $350, uh, if I receive $200 worth of insurance, um, and then the fair market value before was worth $275 for the chair, the fair market value after is zero. So it's a complete loss. So I have a $275 reduction in value. Uh, in this situation, I have the smaller of the reduction in value of 275 or what my basis was of 350. So I have the 275. Uh, but in this situation, because I received 200 of insurance, my actual deduction is only $75. Um, so if we go to the second example here, which deals with the clock, uh, again, we have a cost basis of 90, fair market value of 60. It's completely reduced. I'm limited to the maximum that I could get is the 60 instead of the 90 because that's less than my basis. And in this example, because I did not receive any insurance or any other reimbursement, I get the full 60 for the deduction. Uh, so that kind of just shows you the basic math behind it. Um, and then Alan, I think just with the timing, I don't know if you want to go over some other questions or just kind of wrap up. Oh, we have 10 more minutes. Oh, okay. I didn't know if we were at the 50 mark. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, let's I, uh, yeah, continue this exciting, gripping uh, webinar into the deductions. And Alan, if you want to go forward to slide for me, please. Well, first, first I'm going to go do the last polling question. Okay. The last polling question in Fort Myers, we're going to be having November 7th uh, seminar. You can meet Allison and James. So can you attend? A, yes, and I will. B, yes, but I won't. C, no, or D, all of the above. Answer the word. If you answer D, all of the above, I will send you a free book from our Amazon website, which won't be very good.
Okay, all clear there. So now I'm going, uh, Ken, no, I guess if it's a business property and it has a zero basis, then there's no deduction, I would think. Right, right. And then I'm not sure, would you pay income tax on the insurance payment? I, I hope not. Yeah, that I'm not sure of, um, you know, but again, the, the deductions there, I mean, they're logical in the sense that if you've already fully depreciated the property, um, you know, there's no economic loss that you've really suffered because you don't have a basis in the property. Um, all right, so turning to the couple of examples that we have here, uh, what's great about this section is, I mean, you can tell how old we're talking about here. Somebody purchases an automobile for $3,600 and it makes the regulations. Um, so in this situation, we have a $3,600 automobile. It's for non-business purposes, so we're dealing for personal use. Uh, it's damaged. Um, and it's point, important to note it's an accidental collision uh, instead of an intentional collision with another automobile. And it's funny what you see in the regs. And the fair market value of the automobile is $2,000 before the collision and it's $1,500 immediately after. And then B receives insurance proceeds of $300. So Alan, if we can go to the next slide, uh, what we'll see here is that the actual total deduction is $200. And the way to look at that is we need to look at the value of the automobile before the casualty which was $2,000. The value of the automobile immediately after the casualty is $1,500. So I have a $500 destruction amount. Um, because of that, I'm, my basis here is $3,600, or I take the lesser of that, $3,600 basis or the $500 difference, so which means here I'd have a $500 deduction. Uh, but again, in this fact pattern, because I received $300 from the insurance carrier, I only get a $200 deduction available. So then now, and again, if we can turn to the next slide. And in this slide, uh, what we talk about in the example is it's the purchase of a building. Um, example two, which we'll go through first, deals with the uh, having a rental building. Uh, then we're gonna switch the fact pattern a little bit to go for a personal use building so you can see the difference. Um, and again, what this is gonna go to is the, the impact of having the separate calculations versus having the calculation be based on the combined value of the items. Um, so in this situation, uh, A purchases land with an office building for $90,000, $18,000 allocated to the land, 72 to the building. Uh, in addition, he planted trees and ornamental shrubs. Um, at the time that the casualty event occurred, the basis in the land is $1,800. The basis in the building is down to $66,000 and the basis of the shrubs and trees are $1,200. Uh, the fair market value of the land and building before the casualty, um, the land doesn't change. The building goes down by $18,000 from $70,000 to $52,000. The fair market value of the trees and shrubs goes from $2,000 down to $400. Uh, there was a $5,000 or $5, worth of insurance for the loss on the building. And um, if we go to the next slide, what we'll be able to do then is calculate how we'd come up with the actual amount of the loss. Uh, so again, so the value of the property immediately before the casualty, and when we're talking about the property, because we're dealing with trader use or trader business property, we have to keep the shrubs separate. So we're just dealing with the actual land in the building here. So the value of that was seventy thousand before, fifty-two thousand after. So I've got an eighteen thousand dollar possible deduction that I can take. Um, in this situation, again, my basis is sixty-six thousand dollars, so I'm not limited by my basis for the deduction. So I could take the full eighteen thousand but I do need to back out the insurance that I received of the 5,000. So I get a $13,000 deduction attributable to the damage that was for the building and the land. Now, when I look at my trees and bushes, that's a separate calculation. Uh, so the value of the property immediately before the casualty was 2,000. The value of the property immediately after is 4,000. So I have a $16,000 or $1,600 possible deduction. Um, but again, I'm limited to the difference or the I'm sorry I'm limited to taking the lesser of my basis or the loss and in this situation because the basis for the trees and shrubs is only twelve hundred dollars I'm limited to a twelve hundred dollar deduction for my trees and shrubs even though I suffered a sixteen hundred dollar property loss if you look at the fair market value and then now and if we can go to the next slide this will show the difference um, and actually we'll push forward one more please Alan I apologize 
So this will show the difference of if I have personal use property, in this situation, I'm able to lump everything together. Um, so my, the value of my property before the casualty was 90,000. Uh, the value of the, uh, less the value of the property immediately after is 70,400. So the total amount of, of reduction that I might be able to achieve is 19,600. Um, here, again, looking at the basis, the basis of the property, because I can calculate the basis combined for the land, the building, and the trees together, my basis is 91,200. So I'm not limited at all by the basis. Um, and instead, I get a $19,600 possible deduction. I have that reduced by the $5,000 for the insurance, but I'm able to reduce for, or take a $14,600 deduction in this example. Um, which is a larger amount than it would be able to take if it was a trade or business property. Same facts. The only difference is that, again, because it's personal use, I can lump the trees into the calculation with the building and the land, and I don't have to do a separate calculation item by item. Uh, so then that being said, Alan, what else do we want to talk about for two minutes? Well, I can go to page, I can go to page 90, and I want to talk about Internal Revenue Code Section 139, qualified disaster payments not taxable to an employee or contractor who receives a Section 139 payment. And here, Section 139 is the code section of the day. As you know, you can uh, print this out and uh, put it in plastic, take it in the hot tub with a glass of wine, explain it to your significant other. The gross income does not include an amount received by an individual as a qualified disaster relief payment. And what is a qualified disaster relief payment? Under B1, it's an individual who receives payment to reimburse or pay reasonable and necessary personal, family, living, or funeral expenses incurred as the result of a qualified disaster. And this hurricane is a qualified disaster. So I should ask all my employees to let me know what their expenses have been as the result of the hurricane, and then I can make payment on this. Maybe I'll reduce their bonus. Maybe I won't. But this will not be subject to employment taxes. It will not be subject to 401k matching. It's just a nice loophole for the employee and the employer. And then number two, to reimburse or pay reasonable and necessary expenses incurred for the repair or rehabilitation of the home. So, and now there's no non-discrimination provision under section 139. So if you're in a C-Corp, you could definitely just pay yourself, have the, the client write a check to themselves from their C-Corp to pay for these types of expenses. Now, if it's an S-Corp or a partnership, the question is, can a 2% shareholder or partner receive this distribution and not have to pay income tax on it? And I think the answer is yes, because it's just not addressed. It's not addressed as being a, a personal benefit. So I could be wrong, but I think it would be best to go ahead and have your clients pay their expenses from their C-Corp, from their partnership, from their S-Corp, uh, write it off as compensation for services rendered and don't put it on the W-2. And, you know, at worst, if the IRS audits it, they don't have such a strong position that there would be penalties <clears throat> or interest. So speaking of interest or lack of interest, you have our email addresses at the bottom of the uh, page here on every page of the slides. <clears throat> we will be sending you a video a copy of this in about two to three hours. Please share it, not for continuing education credit, but because people you know and love may need this information. So Allison and James, thank you very much. Thank you for even staying awake during the tax part of this presentation. <laughs> I can see Allison is typing an email asking if she can get a tax degree next. She's gonna start working on her tax degree at night in all of her spare time. Ken, thanks for doing this presentation. I realize I only invited you three hours ago and gave you no notice. <laughs> and uh, thanks to all the uh, attendees, and thank you especially to cpa.org for providing such a wonderful platform for, for programs such as these. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Can we still answer